Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Laun Aerospace, my mini-series in which I unlock the entire tech tree. A mission statement that has largely been forgotten as of late though, <laughs> as last episode saw the installation of a Kerbin, Minmus and Mun relay network, and this episode sees, well, this leviathan you're seeing now. When I asked my Twitter followers what mission they wanted to see from this series, the most popular response was a mission to Laith. So I thought that it would be a good idea to send a mission to the dual system just prior to this so that we can establish a deep space relay network and permit, you know, and therefore permit constant connection to the Kerbal Space Center, thus enabling the Laith mission to not require any kind of large aerials or, you know, pilot Kerbals on standby at all times, etc, etc. However, some of you may have noticed that our payload is, well, ludicrously large, bamboozlingly big, terribly titanic, egregiously expansive. I could go on, but I think the footage is all that is needed to really illustrate the scale of this thing. The size of our payload, you know, it, it may seem a little bit strange, given that our mission statement is simply to establish a dual network, but I thought that, you know, I, I, I could make the endeavour a little bit more exciting by not only setting up a relay network, but also establishing a deep space outpost orbiting jewel, in that, by that I mean a big space station orbiting jewel. Now, um, on this channel, I used to make a lot of space stations. I used to do. I used to make a lot more than I do now, at least. And you know, when I did make a lot of space station videos, people always seemed to enjoy them more when I made them single launch, albeit some of them requiring some reassembly once they'd reached their destination in what I like to call a flat pack space station setup. I don't know if I coined that. Uh, regarding Kerbal Space Program space stations at least, but that's just how I've always viewed my single launch space stations. Um, we basically kind of cram, we build the space station out in the space plane hangar, typically kind of configuring how we want it, and then I kind of take it apart and sort of try and squash it into the smallest footprint I can get it in, and then attach various RCS ports, uh, SAS wheels, probe cores to the various sections so that it can undock itself and reassemble into the correct conf configuration, kind of once you've got it to, the de to its destination. So that's what I'm doing here. So yes, I could have made this mission far more simple and realistic by simply doing multiple launches because, you know, as mentioned, look, look at the size of that fairing. But, you know, Where's the fun in that? <laughs> and, you know, I think, I, I don't, like like I said, when I used to do a lot more space station videos, people just generally seem to prefer them when they were single launch. So I'm just kind of, you know, doing what the people want. And, well, there's the payload there. So, well, we've just cut away now, but we'll make a maneuver node at Apoapsis, and there you go. So, yes, huge, huge setup. This uh, launch configuration is rather reminiscent of my Mun roving base video, although... Uh, scaled up quite massively. We have those enormous new fuel tanks from the Making History DLC, as well as how many F1 engines is that? There's four, uh, eight, uh, nine F1 engines, I think, per tower, uh, as well as some additional vector engines to help add some thrust. And I guess, you know, gimbal control as well, but that's all in the past, that's gone now. And there we have the interplanetary stage. Now you may have noticed we've not got any nuclear engines, which tends to be the way to go with interplanetary missions. And indeed, I could have had a lot more Delta V uh, packed into this thing had I gone with nuclear engines. But you may have noticed just how massive the space station itself is. If I'd used nuclear engines, our burn times would have been obscenely long. And I'm not going to lie, I didn't have that much time to make this video because... Uh, Patreon donors will know, so you know, get that get that Patreon plugged as well, as well within the within the first four minutes of the video. But uh, no, I have been mentioning this in commentaries as well. I have some exams coming up, well, an exam coming up as part of my as part of my job. I'm required to do kind of CPD, which is you know continued professional development, and I'm currently in the process of expanding my role from just normal eye clinics to doing more specialised medical retina clinics, which requires me to sit some exams. So that's basically been my life this past this past year, you know, as in 2018, as of January the 20th uh, to April the 20th, April the 18th to be specific. Uh, <laughs> April the 20th is also a specific date, but it's April the 18th is when my exams finish. So kind of until the exam is done, most of my life is, is doing revision and work for that, and obviously doing my full-time job on top of that, so. Uh, video editing, I've not had that much time to be dedicating to, which is why, that's basically why I've been doing this entire series, to be honest, because you may have noticed a lot of the missions we've been doing haven't been that, la like, 
uh, what's the what was the word I need? Ambitious in terms of scale, mainly doing Minmus, Mun, Juna, Kerbin system missions. Uh, a because people see the response has been really positive actually to this series, so maybe you guys like seeing more. Uh, I don't say relatable missions, because when I say that people say I'm just bragging about how I'm a god at the game. And yes, while I am indeed a god, I'm not necessarily a god just at the game. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going to get loads of hate comments, but whatever. Uh, I, I don't mean, I'm not trying to be bragging when I'm, when I'm giving advice in tutorials. I'm just trying to, you know, give advice in tutorials, because I have a lot of hours in this game. And so I'm aware of some of the quirks that it has. And some of the, I, rem I, have, I have memories, fond and frustrating ones of some of the struggles I had when I was a newer player. So that's kind of, you know, the message that I'm trying to give with these tutorial-esque videos, not, you know, lol, you're, you're terrible, I'm amazing. So, just to clarify, the uh, the vocal minority, I know the people that said that, it doesn't matter, they'll, they'll, they'll find something else, but that's just... I mean, I'm just trying to drag the commentary out, to be honest, because, like, it's, uh, there's not a lot to talk about, I'm just making maneuver notes, and I've talked about maneuver notes so much, I've pretty much exhausted everything I have to say about them, but we are going to save a little bit of fuel. As you can see from the Delta V in the top right, we only have 517 meters per second left in this stage, which isn't enough to circularize at Joule, but we can do a Tylo gravity assist in order to get ourselves captured. The way you may, you've probably seen, just watching me do it is probably enough information. Just create a maneuver node, get yourself on a Tylo encounter, as long as the Tylo encounter occurs before your overall dual periapsis, and you can just kind of play around with the maneuver node until you get a predicted trajectory that puts you on a circular orbit around dual, and then we'll just finish off our circularization. Unfortunately, we don't have enough fuel to get ourselves into a perfectly circular orbit, but I just didn't really care. It's good enough. The one thing you've got to be careful of is making sure you're not kind of within range of Tylo's gravity well. So I'm just creating a maneuver node here to essentially see if I'll encounter Tylo just by staying in orbit around Joule. And as you can see, we're going to easily miss its gravity well. There's also Bop as well, which is the other planet that we're quite close to actually. But Bop is a very, very, very small celestial body. Not only is it kind of you know, outmatched by Jewel and Lath and Tylo being very close, but also, like I say, it's very, very small. It's smaller than Minmus, for example. In fact, no, it's not. It's slightly bigger than Minmus, but not by much. It's very comparable to Minmus, so we don't have to worry too much about its gravity well. And with that, we can begin construction of the station, and you may have noticed that, uh, well, one of the mission statements of this series was to not leave any debris in, uh, in orbit or in space at any point, and I've been adhering to this statement very well until about 10 seconds ago. You may have seen me ditch that transfer stage. I actually left a little bit of fuel in there because I'm like, ah, yes, I fitted a probe to it so we can deorbit it and, you know, make sure that uh, no space junk is left. Uh, but then I must have either dreamt that I'd fitted a probe to it or just forgotten or modified something and forgotten to reattach it. I don't know. The long and short of it is there is no probe attached to it. So perhaps Maybe I'll make it, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll get rid of it in a live stream or something. Uh, but we will have to go back at some point and deorbit it or do something with it. Because we can't be leaving space junk around Joule. Um, you know, I mean, it has enough delta V. Obviously it doesn't have enough delta V to just crash itself straight into the green planet. But we really only need it to be able to get a Tylo encounter. And then we can just crash it into Tylo. Or we can put it on a sort of grand tour of the Joule system by swinging past the various moons. Which is what I did for the previous uh, dual space station. The, you may have noticed, some of you may have noticed anyway, in the map screen, this thing is called the Jewel 2 station. Uh, that's because my original Jewel station in my last save file, before I retired it and started this one, uh, we had the Jewel 1 station. So this is kind of the Jewel 2. And as you can see, it is absolutely massive. We've got a habitation ring, doesn't spin around unfortunately, so maybe I'll make that a project at some point and to look at in this series, making a station with a functional rotating habitation ring. But we have those enormous amounts of battery power because we're very far from the sun, so uh, solar panels are going to be very ineffective at this sort of distance, which is why not only do we have loads of batteries, but we also have a lot, a lot of the biggest kind of solar panel. We also have a lot of uh, RTGs as well, the ends of the solar panel arms, there's like three RTGs, that's why I kind of clipped them together a little bit, so it just looks like one big long one. And that's it, pretty much. And you also saw me there, there was like a small uh, pole and bop lander with also some science kit that I just sort of docked to um, a better location, really. 
And, uh, well, we'll get back to the uh, actual station itself in a minute. I'll talk more about it. But now that the dual station phase is behind us, we can begin phase two of this mission. And that is the establishment of the relay network. Now, this is going to be, uh, it's going to very much be a lazy approach. I'm kind of doing the air quotes thing here. You can't see it, but I am. <laughs> uh, a lazy approach, or, you know, an approach that would be ideal for unmodded or console users, because rather than faff around with orbital periods and mathematics and whatnot, whatnot like we did in the, uh, the last Relay Network establishment video, um, the, you know, these things... Calculating orbital periods and stuff like that, it's very difficult to calculate those sorts of things without mods. So we're just going to whack these two satellites in high polar orbit around Joule, and by coupling them with our equatorial space station, which is also equipped with a high-powered relay dish, it will mean that the majority of the Joule system will always be connected to the KSC. It's not a perfect network, as there will still be black spots at times, but these will be relatively infrequent, hopefully. Um, it's not a complete network, I would like to maybe expand it a bit more at some point. Eventually the network, when, it's, when it is expanded and completed, um, in order to make sure that the entire dual system is covered, um, what I'll probably do is add kind of two equilateral triangle setups of three satellites per triangle in the system as well, so one ring of relays will be in low dual, and or dual orbit, probably in between Leith and Val, and one will be a ring of satellites in high dual orbit around near Pole. Or alternatively, I might just stick a few relays in orbit around all of the moons and just be done with it. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, I'm not really bothering with orbital periods or anything like that here today. Just throwing these satellites up at approximately 90 degree orbits rel relative to each other. You know, if I, if I want it to be perfect, I, I'd, I'd set the periods to be uh, the same. By the way, orbital period, if, that, if you're not quite sure what that term means, it basically means the time taken to uh, complete one orbit. And which, like I say, there's no way of uh, seeing that in the stock game without kind of either creating maneuver node just behind your ship and seeing the time taken to maneuver node, or just kind of, you know, calculating orbital speed and apoapsis, periapsis, height, that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, well, that's the relay. So, um... Yeah, like I say, if I wanted to be perfect, I would have set the periods to be the same and also have them opposite on or orbit on opposite sides of the planet to each other, but, you know, this is good enough for what I need it for. The downside of this network is that even though I'm using the most powerful relay antennas in the game, uh, they're still not powerful enough to communicate with vessels in low dual orbit if those vessels don't have their own communications aerials as well. In fact, even the space station, which is the same communications equipment as these relays, but is obviously much, much lower around dual, um, it, won't, it isn't powerful enough to reach a vessel on lathe without having an additional aerial on the vessel it's trying to communicate with. For those that don't know, in order to calculate relay strength, you take the power of the relay, which um, these ones are uh, 100G or 100 billion, you multiply that by the power of the relay you're trying to uh, con communicate with. So, for example, all um, command modules have a 5k antenna. You multiply them together and take, take the square root. So, essentially, in order for a ship to communicate with these kind of high orbital uh, relays, you need to use at least the communit Communitron DTS-M1, uh, which is the medium-sized white aerial that folds into that small form factor. It's like the first medium-sized aerial that you unlock. Uh, you'll need that one if you're doing a if if you're doing a mission to duel with this sort of network. But you know, it's much easier than taking one of the big heavy satellites. So, uh, big heavy satellites, big heavy aerial. So, I think this is an acceptable compromise. And like I say, we're not. This is won't, this is not the end of my my dual network. But there we go. Lest we carry on talking over the uh, the final shots of the space station, we've expanded the solar, extended the solar panels, uh, deployed all of the aerials fired up some of the uh, science units, a lot of it's for show, for example, the um, the resource scanners aren't actually that necessary, but they look pretty cool, and since this is so big anyway, we may as well just whack everything on here anyway, and we can get a little Kerbal on EVA, and just take a look at it, and with the, uh, the narrow field of view, you can kind of really get a sense of just how massive this thing is, I mean, it's not the biggest space station I've ever made, and certainly by other people's standards might not be that big, but I think it's a fairly sizable thing, especially for something so far out, and again, something that was launched in one go. Now, for those wondering, this is all stock, there are no modded parts, I probably should have clarified that earlier, uh, but we are using the Making History DLC pack. Uh, but there we are, there's our Kerbal on EVA, just having a look. So we've got those science tubes there. The part of this is why I didn't include a time-lapse 
for this particular video. Let me know, do you guys like seeing the time lapses of me making the ships at the beginning of the videos? That's been what I've been doing for previous episodes of this series, but for this one, because it's such an intricate build, I was moving around the camera a lot, and it was quite a long building process, so I didn't bother including the time lapse on this occasion. If you'd like me to upload it as a separate video, I can do though, so just let me know. I'll probably, I might make a music video for this version as well, so in the next couple of days you may get a notification for a music video version of this as well. But it's just an example of, you know, using those science tubes there. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, to be honest. We can do a nice panning around shot. One thing I will mention that I stopped talking about is that uh, you can see it there, that ion ship. That's just for getting visiting Paul and Bop, and it can land on those planets as well, or moons, I should say. And it has a few of the science kit as well, bar the Mystery Goo and Science Junior. The downside is uh, it, I forgot to add an aerial, <laughs> so you need to have a pilot to use it, unless you don't mind not making maneuver nodes which uh, is a bit of an inconvenience, especially if you get in places like Pol and Bop, which have very small uh, sphere of influences, so it's quite useful to be able to kind of see, make maneuver nodes and see where the best places to get encounters with them will be. But, you know, it's modular. I can just send a little unit that can dock to its docking port and build upon it a little bit so we can add aerials, that sort of thing. We'll have to send a mission up to Jewel anyway, like I said, to uh, deorbit the uh, debris that it's kind of floating around in deep space. But luckily, as I mentioned, it has some fuel left in its tank, so all we need to do is attach a small probe core and a reaction wheel, and we should be good. And we can board our Kerbal on using one of the new docking ports, the inflatable docking port. And there we are, and we're now we've boarded, we can zoom out and have a look at what's on screen. Uh, top left is the full playlist of Land Aerospace. The top right is the other dual video in which I built it in my last save before I made this save file. And the bottom right was just chosen for you by YouTube's algorithm. Other than that, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter or join my Discord, or if you want to, you can support me on Patreon. All the links to these are in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day.